Mobile, the first team coaching staff and the first team players. Well done ladies and gentlemen, a fitting welcome for the first team squad and the coaching staff. And put your hands together for the manager, Michael Beale. Well Michael, it's great to see you again. It's been a while, a couple of days, hasn't it? Exactly, yeah. Um, congratulations on the win yesterday. You must have been pleased to, to get those three points, you know, and the goals at such a tricky venue. Yeah, first of the evening everybody. Uh, it's great to be here on, on obviously the opening. I saw it from the original plans to this evening and it's... A fantastic addition to Ibrox, which is obviously an iconic stadium. I did the drum roll there, didn't I? So I'll, I'll move on to the game. <laughs> Yesterday I was delighted, is, uh, is the best way to put it. The squad is, is in good harmony at the minute. They're getting good results, and I'm really pleased with them. And, of course, Captain James Tavernier adding another couple of goals to his tally. And, and Kimar Roof, you can always count on him when, he, when he's involved. Yeah, obviously we'll forgive Tav for the missed penalty last week. Tav made that game a little bit more interesting and that, that went under the radar a little bit last week, actually. But no, fantastic. The free kick, I had the best view and, and it was a fantastic goal. And it sets you up nicely for next weekend. The, the unbeaten run since you came in continues. And how are you looking forward to your first cup final as a manager? I'm really looking forward to it. It's exactly what I, I wanted when I come back in. If you, if you visage, we had the semi-final and a, a tough schedule. The boys have done really well, but we know that the, the days that we're really going to be judged on. I think history with this group of players will look back on it fondly. We have a league win, a, obviously a Scottish Cup win in the, in the last two years and a Europa League final. But what I would say to your boys is your legacy is to be written yet. And so I would encourage you to seize the moment. Let's get things going officially now then, because um, we're celebrating the opening of the new Edmiston House and this incredible development and this new incredible facility for Rangers Football Club. I'd therefore like to welcome onto the stage Rangers Chairman Douglas Park and Managing Director Stuart Robertson. <laughs> Good evening everyone, it's fantastic to see you all here tonight and uh, great to see the venue looking the way it does as well, but quite a different look from the, the fan zones on a Saturday. Uh, just to start, I, th I thought the pipers outside tonight were, were tremendous, uh, the young Govan pipers they're called and a lot of them from Govan High School, so it's great to, to involve uh, you know, kids from the local community in a night like this evening. On behalf of Douglas... Are you going? Oh. Yeah, there. <laughs> behalf of Douglas Park, Chairman and the rest of the board, it's a great honour to welcome you all to this, the Edmiston House Gala Dinner. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Lord Offord, who's here representing the, the UK Government this evening. And Edmiston House is presented by the Parks Motor Group. And it's fantastic to see a large representation from Parks here this evening as well. In 1971, and I just noticed at the back of the menu is actually got some pictures from the original Edmiston House. The original Edmiston House was built on this very site and it was state-of-the-art for its time. 52 years later, we, with the help of many, have delivered what we believe is a, a worthy successor. A successor we will proper, properly celebrate with tonight's opening. All at the club are delighted with secured what is already recognised as the Premier Fan Zone and the Premier Fan Experience in Scotland. As you can see, and as Emma's already mentioned, it's multifunctional. The football fan zone, the match day, music and concerts, dinners, weddings, conferences and seminars, and next month will hold its first concert. It's great for our club, it's great for the local community of Govan and Ibrox, and it's great for our city and those who are now employed here. It's right we set the standards for fans in our era. It's appropriate that Rangers leads and delivers what fans deserve in match days. 
too often you, you know, when they come in here early on a match day and people are just milling about, there's nothing for them to do. And this facility gives them something now that they can really enjoy. Within a month, this space has become a must-visit venue for fans on a match day. It's particularly gratifying to see families enjoying a day out in pleasant and modern surroundings. As a club, we pride ourselves on our history and our success, but we must always strive to innovate, improve and challenge the age-old certainties. For example, we're rightly proud we were the first club to professionalise women's football in Scotland. Every fan of Rangers, regardless of which part of the world they're in, looks to Michael and his staff to deliver on-field success. And to deliver off-field success also requires what Michael has in abundance. It's been relentless, been aspirational and delivering excellence. This spectacular facility could not even have been considered if it wasn't for the unwavering support of our directors, our investors, our founding fathers, our patrons and our supporters. I mean, Emma mentioned 6,000 supporters took up the package that, that was on offer and that, that is an incredible number and we're very, very grateful for that. All of whom have contributed so much to make this possible. I also thank the Rangers staff who have worked really hard to deliver Edmondson House. And tonight, I can formally state and I do so with sincere gratitude, thank you to one and all. Thanks also to the contractors and consultants, some of whom are here, who had to contend with the perfect storm of a pandemic and a challenging economic backdrop. And I also wish to place on record my thanks to Anne-Marie O'Donnell and our team at Glasgow City Council for their assistance and support on this journey. In a few weeks, we'll have another celebration when we open for the first time the doors of the club's new museum, which will be right above us on the first floor. It's not just a museum for our fans, but for people from around the world to visit and appreciate the story of Rangers' history. A club museum has been discussed for many, many years, and I'm excited personally that it's finally coming to fruition. And talking of Rangers' history, tonight is not only about celebrating Edmiston House. Later this evening, and for the first time in almost 10 years, three players will be inducted into the Rangers Hall of Fame. Tonight is an opportunity for us to celebrate the magnificent contributions these players have made to Rangers, and for their names to appear forevermore alongside those who have gone before them, and all of whom have helped Rangers become the institution it is. Lastly, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have a wonderful evening. I'd like to introduce our chairman, Douglas Park, and say a few words and give you the loyal toast. I would like to say on behalf of the board, a big thank you to everybody, all the investors, everyone here, players, management, staff. I thought I should maybe read out all the names, but then I realised if I did that, I might miss the game next Sunday and I'm not doing that. <laughs> so please, would you raise your glasses. The King. I am thrilled to welcome back to the club. It's been a, it's been a little while since uh, I've managed to catch up with my, my old friend, but I'm delighted to welcome back to the club Clive Tilsley, ladies and gentlemen. Give him a warm welcome back to Glasgow. Uh, it's a very good evening from me, Clive Tilsley, and welcome to Govan and the long-awaited opening of Edmiston House. I can see one or two of the players looking a little bit nervous and wondering whether commentators really do talk like this all of the time. <laughs> There's good news on that front. Um, one or two of the sober people in the room may have noticed that I'm not from Glasgow. Uh, when Raiders TV asked me to commentate on some games for them here in the August of 2020, I wasn't sure how I'd be received. An outsider from down south, commentating on your team, your football club, on your TV channel. When I made the back page of the record for something that I said during the very first commentary, I really wasn't sure at all. What I said, I don't know if you remember it, was stopping 10 in a row shouldn't be the motivation. Motivation should be a positive thing. 10 shouldn't be the number, 55 should be the number. <laughs> Fortunately for me, <laughs> 55 duly arrived, gloriously, invincibly. 
I had one or two Glaswegians telling me to mind my own business and get back down the road fast. <laughs> The 55 was an absolute treat for me. Football's all about memories. It's played in the here and now. Michael and the team are judged on the last result, the last kick of the football. But when the final whistle blows and our body temperatures return to 98.6, it's the memories that we talk about, the memories that we savour and treasure, the memories that bring us back. Football creates some of the most indelible memories of our lives. The three guys that are about to be inducted into the Hall of Fame have given thousands and thousands of people that they will never meet some of the very best moments of their lives. For me, to have the opportunity to be a small part of some of those moments, those memories, was truly a privilege. It's worth all the stick that commentators get. But to actually make those moments, to make them through your talent, and your athleticism and your professionalism, that's really special, probably more special than you realize at this moment in your lives. I love my time working here. Once I learned one or two ground rules, I was made to feel so welcomed by the Rangers family, made so many friends and made so many memories. With each and every visit, I came to learn more and more about the part that this club plays in the lives of so many people. I've honestly never known a football club where the fans know so much about the history of the club, about the four boys and all that followed. We are the people. It says, says it all. I continue to work on some games after the turnstiles opened again here, and sometimes for a quick getaway back to the airport, I put my collar up at the end of the game and I'd walk up with the crowds up to, I had a little rendezvous point up by Asda on Helen Street to meet a pre-arranged taxi. And as I walked, I'd see and hear the fans' reaction to another win, another champion performance. I hope you guys know the joy and the wonder that you bring to the lives of those proud fans. It's, it's magical. It's, it's unique, and it's, it is particularly unique here at Rangers, where the bond, the connection between the football club and what it represents is so strong with those supporters. So thank you for having me, thanks for the memories, and go and make some more. To Announce the first winner and the first inductee of the Hall of Fame in 2023. Please give a very warm welcome to someone who's not shy of a goal or a goal celebration in the famous light blue jersey. It's Chris Boyd! Days, man. Seriously. <laughs> There's one thing. You might end up dropping this, but I'd like to welcome Alan McGregor to the stage. Thanks very much. Um, Dodgy, you are right, it's very bright up here. Um, again, like, like the chairman said, if I was to thank everybody, I'd probably miss the game on Sunday as well, to be honest with you. Um, but this is a special moment for me. Um, so honoured and privileged to receive this award. Um, might get a wee bit emotional, but... Um, no, it's just for this great institution to be, for my name, to be on that marble staircase for for the rest of the time. Um, it's a very special moment for me. Um, I just want to thank everybody that's helped me in that way. Thank you. I know how much you're looking forward to this. <laughs> You've always been a man who let your football do uh, the talking. Um, before we talk about you, 
Um, talk to me about Billy Thompson and the part that he played in your life. Um, he was a massive influence at a critical stage in my career. Um, he came to Rangers, I think I was 19 or 20. And I just recovered from a wrist injury. And he got me back through that. And I remember I was away on loan twice when he was a coach. And it was when Paul Le Guin came in. Obviously, I'd played then for a year at Dunfermline. And I was obviously choking to keep playing. I was 24 at the time. And I said to him, listen, what's happening here? Because obviously Paul Le Guin brought in Lionel Letizia. And she just wait, calm down, just bide your time and wait. And luckily that paid off. Yeah, I wonder if the Alan McGregor of today um, was giving advice to the Alan McGregor of 22, 23, <laughs> 24, which were frustrating years for you. Dunfermline you was good for you, but actually the first four or five years at Rangers, what, particularly with the injuries that you got when you were young, they were difficult, weren't they? Yeah, um, I broke my wrist when I was 17. I was maybe out for about 20 months at that stage, and it was a sort of touch and go if the operation would actually work. So I'm um, obviously grateful that I did. And at that time, um, I, don't, I can't remember if there was a transfer window at that time, but they could just go and buy anybody at any stage. So obviously coming through at Rangers, was, it was difficult. But... Um, I'm, I'm glad I, I took Tom's advice in that, to be honest with you. You went to Switzerland and pushed Stefan Kloss off his bike, didn't you? I didn't go that far, to be honest with you, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's strange how um, opportunities come. Have you always been a serial competitor in life? Were you the same as a kid? I probably was, yeah. Um, I think at my boys' club, we won everything at boys' club level, so that stood me in good stead to come here. Um, and it's a must-win every game. doesn't matter who it is against. This club demands to win every game. What's the longest putt you've ever conceded? The longest what? Putt that you've ever conceded to an uh, opponent. About two feet, maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no further questions, Your Honour. I mean, if, if you're sitting watching a quiz show with Cheryl, do you let her win sometimes? You, no. No. Chance, no. You let your daughter score against you when you're in the back garden? No, oh, no, chance. no, no. no. <laughs> you never learn either, otherwise, do you? <laughs> I guess, apart from Billy, Walter's return to the club was what re changed everything for you, yeah? I think I was semi-established at the time before Walter came, but it was a great time. Um, it was obviously great for the club, great for him. Obviously, the staff as well, that he brought in, Durante, Coiste, like, it was... It was perfect. It was so enjoyable to play. Um, it was a great camaraderie with, with all the boys and the staff. And, and you were the Scotland goalkeeper during many of those sort of four or five years that followed. What did that mean to you? It's a great, obviously, it's a great honour. You want to represent your country. Um, I managed to get, I don't know, 40 odd caps, so that was, it was, it was brilliant. Has goalkeeping changed during that period? Have you had to adapt to? different demands on the goalkeeper of today? Um, I suppose nowadays it's more about a lot of teams want to play out for the back and the goalie has to be good with the ball at your feet. Um, but I'm a bit old and I think I'd rather keep the ball out than be able to pass the ball 20 yards to my right back, to be honest with you. But that's just football nowadays. I think it's fairly apparent that your number one priority is keeping the ball out. Oh, I, think I think Scott Tiffany saw that just last week. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. To be fair, I, I was raging at the time. <laughs> but in hindsight, um, once I calmed down, it was definitely the right thing to do. <laughs> With gritty teeth. <laughs> I, we don't share much in common, but I'm getting to a stage in my career where I think maybe my age is held against me a little bit. Mm. What I try to impose on the younger people around me are the standards that I was taught when I was young. How important are your standards and therefore the standards of this football club to you? Well, I got brought up with the standards being very high. Um, I know it's, times have changed and football's changed. Um, we used to do 
jobs for the first two years, which was, it was hard going, but I, I think it gave you a character and it stood you in good stead um, for, for life after your, your two years. It was a two years apprentice, just clean boots, clean away dress room, clean the balls, make sure the bibs and everything's on the bus for training. Um, I, th I think it was a good thing. Hated it at the time, but I think it makes you a better person for it. You're the ninth goalkeeper to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. You were following Gorham, Kloss, McCloy, Dawson, Brown. It's extraordinary company. I know that you had a pretty emotional speech at the Player of the Year dinner the year before last. You try not to show your emotions, but that's quite something, isn't it, this Hall of Fame? It's special. It's, um, I'm not really one for individual awards. I'd rather the team won awards. Um, but this is it's definitely special for me. I, I don't want to talk to you about retirement because you don't want to talk about it. Um, all I would say is that it seems to me that it's going to be your decision when it happens. You will know when the time is right, yeah? Yeah. Um, I think other people might tell me that as well, to be fair. But no, I, think, I, I don't really think about it. I think about the next game. And um, I did that last season. I know at the end of the Scottish, the Scottish Cup final last year, people might have thought that. But I really never thought about it because there was that much going on. Um, and when I went away took some advice, took, spoke to a lot of ex-players, um, Boyd being one of them, actually. And he says, um, just go as long as you can. I mean, that was the Hollywood ending at Hamden last year, but you, you don't do Hollywood endings, do you? No, I get that, and I, I took weeks to, to think about it, and I think, see, when you get that feeling, the winning feeling, you, you want more of it. Definitely do. Well, thank you for being honest. If we turn the clock back 10 years, turn the clock forward 10 years, what do you think? You, do you think you'll still be around football? Do you, do you have an ambition to coach? I've, uh, I've no, actually, no. Um, <laughs> I remember we were in Dubai for a pre-season trip and uh, Andy Hardy and Murph got an email for the, to do their beer licence. I looked at it and I went, well, that's not for me. <laughs> so I'd like the idea of it. But the process to get it is, is a bit more difficult, I think. But oh. you never know. You never say never. I don't so think I the don't. process is going to scare you. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the timeless Alan McGregor.